In the context of this video, our guide will be mainly Article 1, Section 10 of the U.S. Constitution, where it states, no state, uppercase S, shall enter into any, notice that word, any, not a few, some, or perhaps this or that, but any treaty, alliance, or confederation. That includes, of course, with companies, corporations, foreign entities, foreign states, whatnot. Anyway, uh, grant letters of mark and reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. Now, I can guarantee you that the current states, uppercase S, that we have today, in fact, do pay debts with things other than gold and silver coin and have, in fact, entered into both treaties, alliances, and confederations with foreign entities, no less, such as all of the accords and agreements and whatnot that each of the states have with their foreign sister country organizations and whatnot. But the payment of debts also. So those things are direct violation of this particular clause, which directly prohibits those things. Uh, or pass any, well, nor pass any bill of attainder, ex post facto law, or law impairing the obligation of contracts, or grant any title of nobility. Now, for the purposes of this video, we should focus a little bit on that word, bill of attainder. And we're going to look at that further on in this video. <clears throat> it also states that no state, uppercase S, shall without the consent of Congress, that would be a legitimate Congress, mind you, not a fake one, like the one we've had, lay any imposts or duties on imports or exports, except what may be absolutely necessary for executing its inspection laws and the net produce of all duties and imposts laid by any state on imports or exports, shall be for the use of the Treasury of the United States. So not state treasuries, it's not like the state of Alabama has their own treasury that they put this money into. No, specifically for the Treasury of the United States. And all such laws shall be subject to the revision and control of the Congress. Interesting, they spelled control. It's probably a typo which may or may not be in the original document. <clears throat> and no state shall, without the consent of Congress, lay any duty of tonnage, keep troops or ships of war in time of peace, enter into any agreement or compact with another state or with a foreign power, or engage in war unless actually invaded or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. Now, that last part is clearly misrepresented and misadministered on purpose, but they could possibly argue that their way out of that one, at least when it comes to arguing it, it through force to the people, because <clears throat> they always back their stuff up with force, their quote-unquote iron fist in a velvet glove idea. But that first part, those are direct prohibitions on the states with no lead way for wiggling their way out. And those direct prohibitions, I guarantee you, all of them are currently being broken by said states. And they cannot argue legitimacy based off that first part in any way. There is no grant from Congress or anyone else that allows them to violate those direct prohibitions, which they currently are. So let's go ahead and look at some evidence of those direct violations of that specific section of the Constitution that directly prohibits the states in direct language with no room for interpretation that they can't do that and yet they continuously do and I suppose they hope that we won't notice um, I'm sure that they do try and argue their way out of it but there's no way to argue that. If they're doing that, that is in direct violation of the Constitution, and that illegitimizes them as a state.
They, are, they cannot claim to be constitutional states if they're violating a direct prohibition in which there is no room for interpreting it to do exactly what it states that you can't do. But they'll do that anyway. Go figure. So, under the Fourth Amendment, it states the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures, seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now let's look at that wording a little bit. The right of the people to be secure in their persons. So there we do have the word right being used in context of an amendment. But it's to be secure in their persons' houses, papers and effects, against unreasonable searches and seizures, and it will not be violated. It doesn't matter the context the subtext, pretext, or any other texts and excuses they use to do just this. Also, no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation. So you can't issue a warrant to seize someone's property, which is constantly done, mind you, without an oath or affirmation. That requires somebody to pen their name to it, not a faceless entity going by the name code enforcement agent and nothing else to come and seize your property by force. That is an illegitimate acquisition by force, which there's a particular word for it when it comes to property. But this is being done all over the place currently in the United States, in every state, in direct violation of the Fourth Amendment. Then we have the Fifth Amendment. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual time service in time of war or public danger, nor shall any person be subject to the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. In the context of this video, that last sentence is the most important. That is what they call eminent domain. It is, in fact, the clause they use for the so-called condemnation of property and declared abandonment so that they can unlawfully and unconstitutionally acquire that property specifically without just compensation. They do not justly compensate ever. The owners of that property, they bring forth charges of code violations and the eminent domain clause is what they call this, is the color of law that they use to forcefully take people's property in violation of the Fourth Amendment and subsequently the Fifth Amendment. And the states do this. Specifically, individuals within the police departments and sheriff departments and all of the other armed state forces that they use as troops, as uh, Gestapo of a sense, to take all of our stuff. And there, the word for that, we will see later. So let's go ahead and look at evidence from the various state codes. The Code of Virginia, Chapter 2, Condemnation Procedures. Article 1, General Provisions. So, uh, 25.1-200, Chapter Controls Condemnation Proceedings. Unless otherwise specifically provided by law, all proceedings for the condemnation of property under the power of eminent domain shall be brought and conducted according to the provisions of this chapter. That eminent domain that they're referring to allegedly comes from that one section of the Constitution of acquiring lands for public use with just compensation. And interestingly, they're stating that unless it's otherwise specifically provided by law, meaning the Constitution, 
which it is specifically provided by the Constitution. Although I'm pretty sure what they're re referring to is not the Constitution because these codes don't follow the Constitution. Anyway, we go down below it. It states jurisdiction of condemnation proceedings. Jurisdiction of proceedings to condemn property under this chapter shall be in the circuit court of the county or city wherein such property or the greater portion thereof proposed to be condemned is situated unless otherwise specifically provided by law. It is otherwise specifically provided by law in the Constitution. But they could probably argue themselves out of that one, as they usually do. Under Title X, Courts and Judicial Procedures, Special Procedures, Proceedings, Chapter 61, Condemnation, this comes from the state of Delaware, states, Application of Chapter. This chapter shall govern the procedure for all condemnations of real and personal property within this state, capital S, under the power of eminent domain exercised by any authority whatsoever. Now, I don't know about you, but any authority whatsoever is not something that is allowed in the Constitution. Of course, it also does not allow eminent domain. Well, in some cases, I suppose it kind of does allow eminent domain to the state specifically, but those would be legitimate states anyway, of which these are none. None of these are legitimate. <clears throat> Uh, governmental or otherwise. So there, this is basically stating that they can take your property under the exercise of eminent domain and it doesn't have to be a governmental outfit that does it. Probably because they're not truly governmental. Jurisdiction of Superior Court Filing of Complaint. All condemna condemnation proceedings within the state shall be commenced by filing a complaint as provided in a chapter in the Superior Court in and for the county where the property is located or if part of such property is situated in one county and part in another. Then in either county, the Superior Court shall have exclusive jurisdiction of all condemnation proceedings. Like how they always declare their jurisdiction. As in, they're the supreme law of land, apparently. Then we have these divisions of state lands. Interesting word there. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection's Division of State Lands is Florida's lead agency for environmental management and stewardship, serving as staff to the Board of Trustees of the Internal Improvement Trust Fund. That would be an entity worth checking out. Guarantee they're not on the up and up. The division's role goes far beyond just acquiring lands for protection, naturally. It provides oversight for the management of activities on more than 12 million acres of public lands, including lakes, rivers, and islands. These public lands help ensure all Florida residents and visitors have the opportunity to truly appreciate Florida's unique landscape. Now, of course, the public they're referring to is the juridic public, a topic which I have covered in previous videos. Florida Forever is Florida's Conservation and Recreation Lands Acquisition Program. Notice that. <clears throat> Conservation and Recreation Lands Acquisition Program to acquire land. A blueprint for conserving our natural resources and renewing our commitment to conserve our natural and cultural heritage. It replaces Preservation 2000, P2000, the largest acquisition program of its kind in the United States. With a total of 10.1 million acres of conservation land in Florida, more than 2.4 million acres were purchased under the Florida Forever and P2000 programs. That sounds like money laundering to me. And also unlawful land acquisitions. The Division of State Lands also assists landowners. Yeah, assists. Uh, who want to sell land to the state, buy land from the state, or gain access to public lands. That last part is the most important. These are the people who sell off the ill-gotten gains that were stolen under the color of law. Then when we go to Nevada, State Lands provides the expertise to acquire and hold lands for the state of Nevada. But we don't simply hold titles. We collaborate with private businesses, citizens, federal and state-based agencies to effectively and responsibly use the resources our state has to offer. There's some coded language for you, just like the rest, really. Above all, we believe in public service and the importance of being thoughtful and responsible with our Nevada landscape. 
Then when we look at Board of Land Commissioners, the first hit is the California Land Act of 1851. Under the Wikipedia blurb, it states the California Land Act of 1851 enacted following the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the admission of California as a state in 1850 established a three-member public land commission to determine the validity of prior Spanish and Mexican land grants. And there we get a mention of how this land grant stuff has been at work, something that we are very much not taught in the public school system, which is designed to create willing and obedient slaves. It also states that if that it then consisted by appointment of President Milliard Fillmore of Highland Hall, Harry J. Thornton, and James Wilson as commissioners. In 1853, President Franklin Pierce changed the board by the appointment of Alphus Felch, Thompson Campbell, and R. August Thompson as commissioners. Yeah, so three people get to determine all the land grant patents and whatnot. That doesn't sound suspicious. And then the State Board of Land Commissioners, Land Board, comprises Idaho's Governor, Secretary of State, Attorney General, Superintendent of Public Instruction, and State Controller. The Land Board provides direction to the Department of Lands in managing more than 2.5 million acres of state endowment trust lands in Idaho. And I guarantee that these people all gain wealthy plots of land through their involvement in these groups because it's it's all it's all built around land land is the foundation to their house of cards with their investment in land and with their ability to retain fraudulently taken land they fall as well if if their claim to land is found to be fraudulent then they will essentially lose all of their fortunes hence why they have to have direct control over it so that's why you have these commissioners that equally hold other offices like attorney general superintendent of public instruction governor secretary of state so on and so forth so let's go ahead and look at some of the procedures for this specifically at a property that was put up for auction in Logan, Ohio, 324 North Spring Street. This state's reserve price met, <clears throat> current bid 22100 5th of April 2023, uh, posted on, ending on 3rd of May 2023, and is in Hawking County. Now, it states the year it was built was in 1900, and the annual taxes are of record and lot size of record. Of course, those are the annual property taxes, and we don't really need to get into that in this video, but those are just as unlawful as everything else they do. Anyway, defendant is Brand Lee J. Dennison, trustee. There's the file number, case number, appraisal amount is in a city, Logan, two bedroom, two bath, square foot, 1,710 per auditor. And it states there it's not available for showings. In the description, it states court ordered sale by private selling officer or PSO. Isn't that interesting? That those are your other than governmental authorities that carry out this quote unquote eminent domain garbage. All information we have on the property is included. We have no additional information. Property condition is unknown. No showings, no trespassing for any reason. And that's a, another ill-appropriated so-called law regulation that they do, the trespassing stuff. No contingency. Oh, and the trespassing thing was obviously the base for their mask mandates. No contingencies permitted, sold 100% as with all faults. Auction ends May 3rd, 2023 and is online only. Well, isn't that interesting? So what happens if you buy it online, but then it's found out to be legitimate and your money just doesn't do anything. Isn't that interesting? 
Anyway, Ohio foreclosures. Information is thought to be correct but not guaranteed. 10% buyer premium added to the high bid. 5,000 deposit is due with it. Deposit is due within 24 hours of bidding end. Licensed Ohio real estate agents seeking a commission must meet the associated requirements by properly registering themselves as the agent through the link within each individual auction their client will be bidding on before their client places any bids whatsoever. No exceptions. The rest will be up to the buyer as they will have to successfully register themselves as an individual or and then when we look at the list of bidders, <coughs> we get the first two initials of a name and the rest of the name is blacked out and terminates in one, meaning that you have essentially for this property about five bidders that are all uh, probably holding companies and real estate corporations that all wind back to the same individual owner and they're outbidding themselves essentially. That's likely what's going on here to give the perception that this is not money laundering and things changing hands. But given the benefit of the doubt, we can't even prove that because they have blacked out most of the names when it comes to redacted most of the names when it comes to these entities. And a search for the first two letters will be very difficult to provide anything. As when I did so, I took the name of the partial name of the first bidder, SK, and put it in Real Estate Ohio. And naturally, there are many different entities that come up SK Realty Properties, SNK, and, and it, it could be that it's not even any of these, that it could be actually just the first two letters of a, of a name, specifically like Sky or, or Skunder, who knows different SK names that it could be. So there's no real way to know who exactly purchased these properties. And why would they possibly want to hide that? It has to do with something called cloud on title. According to Cornell University, a very trustworthy source, ha ha ha. A cloud on title is a claim or encumbrance that affects the ownership of a property and can potentially discourage future parties from purchasing it. These claims or encumbrances can arise from easements or mortgages on the land, or they can arise from a defect in the deed or a lien that may yield to a third party, or perhaps a question of legitimacy of whether or not a property that was sold was actually stolen under color of law, no less. It goes on in Wikipedia to say, in the United States property law, cloud on title or title defect is an irregularity in the chain of title of property that would give a reasonable person pause before accepting a conveyance of title. Just like the title for a car might be stolen, the title for property could be stolen under color of law. And then the person purchasing that property, unless they are completely fraudulent, would wait and think about it before they did so because if it turns out to be the case they would lose that property without any compensation because they had purchased stolen property investopedia states a cloud on title is any document claim or unreleased lien or encumbrance and notice that word encumbrance is very vague that might invalidate or impair a title to real property or make the title doubtful. And this ties into something called a land claim. According to Wikipedia, a land claim is defined as the pursuit of recognized territorial ownership by a group or individual. The phrase is usually used with respect to disputed or unresolved land claims. Some types of land claims include Aboriginal land claims, Antarctic land claims, and postal colonial land claims. Of course, the one thing that they're not going to mention is constitutional land claims about property that was acquired without following due process and a direct violation of the clauses that we just read in the beginning of this video. And then it also states the uh, loyalnigerianlawyer.com 
The claimant must plead in his statement of claim that he and his predecessors in title have been a long and undisturbed or unchallenged possession of the land in dispute. That's a lie. That's not necessarily true. It could be true, but it's not necessarily true. Uh, and states he must also prove by way of oral and documentary evidence that he and his predecessors have been in long possession. No, that's not what's required for a land claim. A land claim simply requires that you lay claim to that land, and whether or not it's a legitimate land claim, that is what has to be founded through evidence. But the claim itself is not necessarily requiring of evidence. And the state capital S, does this all the time where they claim land and offer no evidence about why it's their property. And this comes into the term adverse possession. This is the term that refers to all of the things that we recently talked about, where they condemn something or they state that it violates municipal codes or whatnot, and then they unlawfully, adversely possess it through force. They send their uniformed Gestapo to go in and remove that person from the property so that they can then sell it unlawfully. That is unlawful adverse possession, whereas you could have lawful adverse possession. If it's done according to the U.S. Constitution, then it would be adverse possession lawfully done because the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land, which has to do with land acquisitions. Naturally, anything that's supreme law of the land would govern such a thing as adverse possession of property, real property, on the land. And so naturally, this, these definitions that are provided in Google are going to obfuscate the topic. Uh, Wikipedia states, adverse possession, sometimes colloquially described as squatter's rights, is a legal principle in the Anglo-American common law under which a person who does not have legal title to a piece, and it's going to say this whole thing about how if you spend enough time on land, then it's quote-unquote legally yours. And then in the same Wikipedia article, this blurb more accurately describes it, stating adverse possession is a method of acquiring complete title to land as against all others including the record owner, through certain acts. One of those acts would be through force, through threat of force, or through any other made-up pretext that they require. And because they have, quote-unquote, eminent domain, meaning no one's going to stop them, essentially it's their domain eminently, well, they will acquire that regardless of all others. That is adverse possession. But it's not lawful adverse possession because they're not lawful. They're illegitimate. And they're directly violated other contexts of the Constitution, as well as the one that has to do with this, rendering them illegitimate and ensuring that there will be a cloud on title over all sales, land grants, or any other things that these states have done now in the future and in the past. So then you get into this idea of color of title and an apparent title, which naturally the highlighted definition is a lie. It states from Cornell Law University, or Cornell University Law, Color of title is also known as apparent title. No, it's not. Since the document gives off an appearance of a valid title, but in reality it is defective and invalid. Now, if you look up color of title, it's going to state that the same thing here, which is that it's it appears legitimate, but it's actually defective and invalid. That's similar to color of law, except it's not, because when you're operating under the color of law, it's the idea of operating with a uniform. Somebody could actually be operating under the color of law legitimately, legitimately occupying that. But it usually is used to refer to fraudulent circumstances, the same thing with color of title. But apparent title would be something different. And for the purpose of that, we need to go ahead and look at something else. An heir apparent, you get many different conflicting definitions. 
because they know about the implications that these have to do with their Ill illegitimately acquired property that they sell off and use to function in a, as a foundation for their corrupt state. So when you look up the definitions of heir apparent, you will get a person who seems certain to take the place of someone in power when that person stops working, inheriting, or, and bequeathing. That's the Cambridge University Press and Assessment. That's very far from what an heir apparent is, but Cornell states an heir apparent is an heir who is certain or guaranteed to inherit property from an estate. The right of an heir apparent is indefeasible, and they can only be blah, blah, blah. Collins Dictionary states that the heir apparent to a particular job or position is the person who is expected to have it after the person who has it now. That's not an heir apparent. That's uh, somebody who's, that has to do with succession. Heir apparent to something, an heir whose legal right to receive somebody's property, money, or title cannot be taken away. Practically speaking, the idea of an heir apparent would be somebody who stands the with the most legitimate claim to something, which would mean an apparent title would be a title that has the most legitimate claim among other titles. And then with this word title, we have the title of a book, titles of nobility, and other such titles of codes, law titles, things like that. In the Game of Thrones series, we get a good example of these concepts, where first you had a crazy king who was deposed through rebellion and conquest. That's right of conquest, or right of arms. And... There are virtually no problems until that king dies. And then once that king dies, you have a series of doubts of the heir and succession to the throne. And this is where the idea of Game of Thrones comes from. You have a split about people throwing doubt or cloud of title over the apparent heir the one who has the strongest claim. And then naturally, those other claimants who put doubt on the real possessor, the legitimate possessor of that title, well, they raise their armies and they go and force their claims. And thus, you have a perfect explanation of the overall concept that we're looking at here. Now, we should look at the word attain, because this is another one of these words that is incorporated into this concept that we're talking about in this video. To attain is allegedly, according to Wordnick, to gain as an objective or achieve. To come to or arrive at as through movement, growth, or the passage of time. To succeed in direct effort, process, or progression. And uh, the word reference uh, translation dictionary states it's a uh, we're so close to attaining our goal of raising two million dollars. As an example, attaining something has to do with acquiring it as a, a synonym of the word is acquiring or to take something away or to take, bring something to yourself. And when it comes to the acquisitions of the various state divisions of land and all of these other entities that acquire these lands, such as with the uh, municipal code police enforcement and the sheriffs and all of these other entities that operate under the color of law while well, they're attaining right and remember there's a direct prohibition on a bill of attainder so let's go and look at what the definition of that is under wikipedia it states a bill of attainder also known as an act of attainder or writ of attainder or bill of penalties is an act of a legislature declaring a person or a group of people guilty of some crime and punishing them often without a trial law cornell again <laughs> they're always first on the list for google bills of attainder are such special acts of the legislature as inflict capital punishments upon persons supposed to be guilty of high offenses such as treason and felony and then of course the word felonious apparently has to do with villainous or evil 
but they use these words in, in such a way that they lose their meaning. Anyway, without any conviction in the ordinary course of judicial proceedings. Now, notice nothing there, nothing at all, has anything to do with the word attain. And notice that this is called a bill of attainder, hence attain. So we can look at this from another way, attainder of treason, which is directly referenced in the Constitution. But unfortunately, you get only their interpretations of the Constitution or this little piece of crap that comes from Wikipedia stating, Rainians who used attainder include Margaret of Anjou, her attainder of Richard of York led him to invade England and attempt to seize the throne after uh, the blah blah blah. Edward the fourth or sixth fourth used attainder after killing his brother George Plantagenet, Duke of Clarence for high treason. It also states, in English common law, attainder was the metaphorical stain or corruption of blood, which arose from being condemned for a serious capital crime. It entailed losing not only one's life, property, and hereditary titles, but typically also the right to pass them on to one's heirs. There, it's sort of, kind of, referencing the word attain in that, in those two concepts of attainder of treason and bill of attainder. Now, in the Constitution under Section 3, it states, Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or in confession in open court. The Congress shall have power to declare the punishment of treason, but no attainder of treason shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture except during the life of the person attained. Now let's go ahead and look at that there. It directly stipulates it shall not work corruption of blood into an attainder of treason. But before, we saw that Wikipedia was telling us that attainder of treason is the same thing as corruption of blood. So why is the Constitution here, written far before whoever, whoever uh, brain-dead professor wrote that crap, well, why would they make a distinction between corruption of blood and attainder of treason, stating that corruption of blood is actually something that might be a part of an attainder of treason? But they're not the same thing. A corruption of blood is not an attainder of treason but an attainder of treason might have a corruption of blood in it. And it does directly state that there's a forfeiture involved, hence the word to attain something, and that it will not be done past the life of the person who's being attained. It appears that we have a lot of state attaining going on that is in direct violation of the part of the Constitution that states that Hence the reason why there's all the screwiness with that word. Now, if you have enjoyed this video, please like it, share it, subscribe to my channel, and check out all of my other publications. There are free books available at the link. Also, if you so desire, you may support my work at PayPal or Cash App. And stay tuned, there will be more.